today to 1 Timothy chapter 6. We have so many wonderful singers in our church, including my wife who just sang. I'm a little partial. When I hear that song, um, a man named William Reynolds wrote the song, and he actually taught me in seminary. A lot of y'all may not realize this, but when you study for the pastorate, you have to study everything from Greek and Hebrew all the way to music appreciation. And I think, well, why do I have to take music appreciation? I appreciate music. But they taught us about uh, the history of music. One wonderful thing, if you saw the guys in my class, there was about 30 preachers, uh, you probably didn't want to hear them sing. So we didn't have to sing. Uh, we m merely learned about it. And William Reynolds, who wrote that song, actually uh, taught me some 30-some years ago. Um, we're looking at 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're going to begin in verse 11 in just a moment. But let me say that I have enjoyed this journey personally. Um, we have been studying this book for the past four months. I look back, I believe the first message uh, here in 1 Timothy was June 6. Now, I obviously was out a couple of weeks and people filled in. Uh, but it's been a fun journey for me. I hope that you have learned, as I have, about God's plan and organization for the church. Beginning next week, we're going to begin a seven-week study on the I Am sayings of Jesus in the Gospel of John. This should lead us uh, up almost to the month of November. We're going to be look at, looking at Jesus saying, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am the door for the sheep, I'm the good shepherd. I'm the resurrection and the life, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and I'm the vine. That's a lot uh, and a mouthful of things. We're going to be looking uh, the rest of this month and well into October at that. But we have some unfinished business today. We have talked about 1 Timothy. It is a church manual. It is a how-to for the local church. It's like an owner's manual for, would be for a car. So this book is almost like an owner's manual for the church. And hopefully uh, you've put in your memory bank some of these uh, texts that we have been studying. And most certainly you should be able to return to this book uh, for help in matters in regard to church decisions. Look with me at uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. Verse 11, but you, man of God, flee from these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called and about which you have made a good confession in the presence of many witnesses, in the presence of God who gives life to all, and of Christ Jesus who gave a good confession before Pontius Pilate. I charge you to Keep this command without fault or failure until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. God will bring this about in his own time. He is the blessed and sovereign Lord, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in an unapproachable light, who no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal power. Amen. Instruct those who are rich who are rich in the present age, not to be arrogant or to set their hope on the uncertainty of wealth, but on God who richly provides us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do what is good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and willing to share, storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of what is truly life. Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you, avoiding irreverent and empty speech and contradictions from what is falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some people have de departed from the faith. Grace be with you all. Let us pray. Lord, as we close this series of messages today, I pray, Lord, that you would keep in our minds the very last prayer that Paul just offered that we read, grace be with us all. Father, we need your grace. It is only by your grace that we're saved. It is only by your grace that we were awakened this morning, by your grace that we become more like Christ, and by your grace that we will one day see you 
face to face, those of us who have trusted you. And so, Lord, uh, we pray for your grace as we study this word, this final message today in this series of messages in the book of First Timothy. And we give you the thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, as we look at uh, this last message, we're going to see that Paul really is giving Timothy and us sort of a second helping or warmed over uh, messages about possessions. Last week, you remember, he was speaking to those who would aspire to have lots of material possessions. And we see today that he's going to revisit this subject of the believer and material possessions. But then before he closes the book, we see that he gives a five-fold charge to Timothy. It would be like his last words in this epistle, not knowing Paul didn't know when God would call him home. He was closing out this letter. There were a lot of things that were unsure in Paul's life. And so he pours out these five words of instruction uh, to Timothy. We're going to look at that. And first, though, before we look at what Paul has to say specifically to Timothy as we put a, a wrapping paper and ribbon on this series of messages, I want to go back to what Paul looked at last week and what we just wrote, re read a moment ago, and that Paul gives instructions about material possessions to those who possessed such things. And, and the, the question we have is, what is to be the Christian's attitude toward material things? Are we just to totally forsake those and say, well, spiritually, if I want to be a spiritual person, I must be poor and give everything away? Or is there this attitude of, if God has really blessed me and I'm spiritual, I'm going to have everything. And you can see the polar opposites here. I think as we studied God's Word last week and as we are studying it this week, we're going to see that there is a medium between the two. That we need a balanced, biblical understanding of Christians and how we are to respond to our possessions. Today, Paul is speaking to those in Ephesus who had much. You may have heard the story of a conversation between a $100 bill and a $1 bill. And the $100 bill was bragging to the $1 bill. He said, I've been all over the world. I've been in casinos. I've traveled in foreign countries. I've been on cruises. I've been to the best of concerts and events. The despondent $1 bill said, well, I've only been to churches. I've only been circulated among the Presbyterian Church, the Baptist Church, the Methodist Church. The $100 bill looked puzzled at the $1 bill. He said, what's a church? Everything you and I have is from the Lord. He gives us even the ability to get money. We may think that we're the ones who accumulate all of this, but you could ask people, and maybe there are a few in our community even today who can remember the stock market crash. They may be very few in number, but how things changed in just a moment. That's what God's Word is teaching us. So what should be our attitude is we should welcome the material possessions that we have, but we should not hold on to them too tightly. In fact, the Bible teaches here and elsewhere in the Scripture that we're to be good stewards, good managers of the things that we possess. I wonder today, what type of steward are you of God's material blessings? Last week, we remember, he was speaking to those who aspired to gain much money. They didn't have possessions. But remember how he talked about the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs through the pursuit of something they did not have. But today we see that he's speaking to a different group in the same church. That is those who possessed money. Notice what he says um, here in verse 17, instruct those who are rich in the present age. And then he follows that with a twofold warning. He says, 
not to be arrogant first. Don't be arrogant. Don't look down upon someone who does not have. Many times we associate what someone possesses materially with how intelligent they are. But that's not true. In fact, I would appeal to you, especially in my calling, some of the most intelligent people were the professors that make very little. In fact, I laughed, and I've told professors before, I said, you're, you're making really just a moderate amount of money, much like a teacher would, and you're teaching men that are going to pastor mega churches and make a lot of money, yet they couldn't even do what they were doing if you weren't pouring into them. And so God is warning about arrogance in regard to possessions. Now, why is that? Well, in Luke 12, Jesus told a parable that related a truth connected with what we are looking at today. He told the story of a farmer who himself was very rich, and he was blessed with an abundant yield in, in crops. And what he decided was, I have all of this. I'm going to build bigger and better barns, and I will sit back, basically, and live off of the excess. God's word to him, and this is an interesting parable. You can look at it in Luke 12. When God, in the flesh, Jesus interdirected inter right in the middle of that, these words, you fool, this night your life will be demanded of you. Who then will have your possessions? And then Jesus adds, this is how it will be for one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. The arrogant person looks down on those who do not have. He, he does not understand that all is from God, and that really leads to a second trap that Paul warns Timothy about here in verse 17. Not to be arrogant or what? Tell them not to set their hope on the uncertainty of riches. We're called Christians not to put our hope in our material things, not to put our hope in our money. Many times, and I'm guilty of that too, we're tempted and say, am I going to run out of money before I run out of life? And I'm not saying that we don't prepare for those things and that God does not provide for those things because he does. But our hope is to be in God. And our concern and focus should be on him. That's why we have the warning back we looked at last week of the danger and the snare of the love of money. If we place our hope in our money, then our hope is not in God. But Paul follows it here with the threefold positive charge for Timothy to relate to his listeners. A charge for people like us who have possessions. I wonder today if you have possessions, God's word first says, enjoy them. That sounds strange, doesn't it? It's not a sin to enjoy the possessions you have. Why do we know that? Because the end of verse 17 says, God who richly provides us with all things to enjoy. Now, it is wrong to enjoy our possessions as an end in themselves. Then our possessions become an idol. But we need to be careful that we just don't, don't totally disregard possessions because God's word says that God gives us these things to enjoy. And I appeal to you on the authority of God's word today. The best way to enjoy it is to realize from whom it came. If you realize it's a blessing from God, there's a joy that comes over you as you realize the blessed state of having the possessions that you have. When you admit that it's God who has given you the ability to do that and to make money and to have possessions, your perspective changes. And so it is okay to enjoy them. It's not bad to purchase nice things. It is bad to purchase nice things without acknowledging that God is the one who has given them to you. Our possessions should point us to God. But while we enjoy them, the scripture also teaches us here that we are to share them. Notice verse 18. 
instruct them, the people, to do what is good, to be rich in good works, and to be generous and willing to share. This man in the parable who built the bigger barns, when he received the blessing, what was he thinking? Me, me, me. I'm going to store up. I'm going to build bigger barns. I'm going to protect myself. I'm going to secure my future. What should he be saying? God, you gave this to me. What should I do with it? Now, there's a misprint in the bulletin there. You need to uh, change the first word, Lord, to poor if you're following the outline. That was my mistake. Uh, I'm, I'm errant, not inerrant. But Proverbs 19 says, He who gives to the poor lends to the Lord. Giving to the poor is a loan to God and God will pay it back. Now I'm not sitting here telling you that if you give $50 to somebody you can go in your mailbox later and find $50. That's not making the right connection there. All right. I know some people that have done that. I heard one guy that said a preacher preached something like name it, claim it, give it, and you'll get it back. And this preacher stood up and said, I gave my car away on the interstate, and, and I saw somebody that was walking, and guess what? God gave me a nicer car a week later. Those students that were at the Bible college were listening to it. They began to give away their cars, and guess what? They were hitching a ride to school the rest of the day. What is it saying? When we know, when we know that it comes from God, it gives us joy. It gives us joy to share. It gives us joy when we spend it. It gives us joy in distributing it. It's actually fun because we say, God, you have given this to me. God, how would I use it for your glory? And that leads to the third attitude. Invest them. Invest them. Invest them in things that last beyond the present. Invest in eternal things. Verse 19, Paul speaks of words that are very similar to Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount where he says, storing up treasure for themselves they are by investing in heavenly things as a good foundation for the coming age. And then in verse 19, he speaks of the life that is real life. I wonder today, how are you investing what you have? Even more importantly, will your currency be able to be exchanged into heavenly currency when you change out? Well, Paul gives, and he closes out that study on our possessions, and if I could summarize it, I think we will do well if we can follow this one thing from the depth of our heart, God is the giver of every good and perfect gift. What I have, the ability to gain what I have, is from God. If we can get that straight, then God will show us how to enjoy personally the things, when and where to share, how to invest wisely. But Paul moves on to some final instructions for younger Timothy as we close out this study. These are general instructions. You know, Paul was an ambassador of the Lord God. And in a sense, Timothy was an ambassador of Paul because Timothy was placed in Ephesus by Paul to sort of be his representative. But actually, Timothy was more than a representative of Paul, but he was a representative of the one Paul was representing God. And so Timothy, being a representative of a representative of God, needed to understand these final things that Paul was appealing for him to know. And the first thing he says, and we see it in verse 11, but you, that is Timothy, you man of God, flee from these things. Not only was he to flee the false teaching, but he was to flee the ways of the false teachers. There was to be a clear distinction between the true man of God, Timothy, and those who were using religion for their own gain. Now he says, Flee these things. And going back to your English class in high school, you remember you've got to look for the antecedent. In other words, what is these things pointing back to? What's it pointing back to? What's what we looked at last week about the false teachings? We know in verse 3, they taught 
false doctrines. What else was true? The things from which he was to flee. It says that they were conceited, these false teachers. But not only were they conceited, but they were ignorantly conceited. They had no understanding. Uh, they were divisive. They argued over words, verse 4. They, they were the source of envies and quarrelings, disagreements, verse 5. But then also we see that they were motivated in the spirit of a Balaam. Remember, we looked historically at Balaam last week. They didn't serve God for the care of the people or for the care of God, but for their own position, for their own gain. And so Paul is telling Timothy, flee all of these things. These may be true of the false teachers, but they're not to be true of you. So what's the overlying message for us today? If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're to be distinct from the world. People should look at your life and say, that person's different. I've shared my testimony of when I reaffirmed Jesus' lordship in my life, a season that sort of catapulted me spiritually to follow the call of God in my life, the specific call to ministry. And how God worked was this. I went to college, and we need to pray when our students go to college. We need to pray for them because there's so many temptations. There's so many tests out there. They're out on their own. And what I was trying to do is I was trying to live one, my life with one foot doing what God wanted me to do and the other foot doing what I wanted to do. And I was the most miserable person on the campus of Hampton, Sydney. You say, how do you know that, Rick? Because I literally, on a Thursday night, my roommate was out partying. It used to be a place called D.T. Bradley's. He was in Farmville on a Thursday night. My roommate, not Andy, the one y'all know, but my other roommate, who now is a follower of Jesus Christ, praise God, but he was renowned as a partier. He, he got thrown through the window at D.T. Bradley's one time by two Longwood students. He was crazy. He was out of the room late one night, and I was in there by myself. I started crying like a baby. I was wailing. And I said, God, there's more to life of what I'm living. I know you, but I'm not living for you like I ought to. I didn't even care if he came in the room at that time. But you know what was the impetus? There were some guys that were on the cross-country team at Hampton, Sydney that were involved in something called InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. It was a Christian organization. And when I saw them there, I saw a unity that was not marked by superficial things like partying. I saw a true bond. I saw guys that had joy. There was a peace. And, you know, I didn't say, I don't know what that is. I've got to find out. I was saying, I know what that is, but I'm not experiencing it, God. And through that, I rededicated my life to the Lord. Why was that? Because they were living distinct from the way of the world. We're to flee uh, the negative things. We're to pursue positive virtues. Notice what he says. It's not enough to flee from, but we are to pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. If we can summarize all of those spiritual things, what it basically says is be like Jesus. Pursue Christ likeness. You know, I grew up watching the cartoon Roadrunner, you probably did too. And um, I'll, I'll confess, I always pulled for Wile E. Coyote because I always pulled for the underdog. And week after week, you know where I'm going with this, every Saturday you would turn it on and you knew at the beginning he wasn't going to do it. He wasn't going to get him. I actually looked back online and there was a cartoon in 1980 where he finally caught the Roadrunner for about one minute and they said that he looked at the screen, Wiley Coyote, and he said, okay, you wise guys, you always wanted me to catch him. Now what do I do? And he let him go. He let him go. I thought about that this week in pursuit. Every Saturday when I turned that back on, he was still pursuing, still pursuing. Can you imagine after about a hundred Saturday mornings and you haven't caught him, you think, boy, I think he ought to finally give up. But you come back the next week, there was another acne scheme that he had to try to trap the roadrunner. As we look at old Wiley Coyote, 
we ought to say, man, I admire his perseverance. I admire his pursuit. And I know it's just a silly cartoon, but it spoke to me this week. These things that Paul mentions here, they're attainable. They're not out of reach. They're attainable. How much more should we pursue godliness? You want to know what the devil's scheme is? He wants us to be frustrated. We're making progress, and then we get hit. You know what the devil, oh, you're just the same as you always are. You'll never change. It'll never happen. You know what we need to do? Just like old Wiley Cody, we need to get back up and come back at it again. We need to pursue righteousness. There needs to be a hunger for righteousness. That's what he's speaking about here. But the third thing, we need to be ready to wage spiritual warfare. Verse 12, fight the good fight of the faith. This Christian life, it's a battle. We're in a battle. Paul tells the church at Ephesus earlier, that he's writing to here through Timothy, but then directly to the church in chapter 6, verse 12 of Ephesians, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the principalities, the cosmic powers of the darkness, against evil, against spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare is real. We studied it a few weeks ago. Jude 9, we've talked about looking at Jude. That was the one where Michael, the archangel, the bold angel who fought when he was arguing, the scripture says, uh, over the body of Moses with the devil. He said, the Lord rebuke you. He was in a battle. We we talked about how in Daniel chapter 10 and verse 13, uh, the angel was seeking to come to the Lord, but he was detained by spiritual forces. And so spiritual warfare is a very real thing. Our experience attests to this truth. Jude 9 tells us how we're to do it. We're to say the Lord rebuke you. We're to look to the Lord. We're to put on our spiritual armor in Ephesians chapter 6. We're to fight. And so Timothy, with the, in the midst of these false teachers, he was to stand up and fight. But then a fourth thing, he was to live with a view toward Jesus' return. Notice what he says in verse 12, take hold of eternal life. Hold on to it and don't let go. Now, eternal life has a present aspect and a future aspect. The present aspect in in John 3, 16, it says that whoever believes has everlasting life. That's the present. But there's also a future aspect, and Paul is writing to Timothy about this future aspect, and basically he is saying, persevere with your eyes looking toward Christ with your hands held tightly to eternal life. And he says in verse 12 that Timothy had made a good profession in the midst of many witnesses. I believe that profession was his baptism. Does baptism save a person? No, it doesn't. But baptism is an outward profession where someone says, I believe in the Lord. Timothy had that. But then it says about Jesus confession. Verse 13, Christ gave a good confession before Pontius Pilate. Well, Jesus wasn't baptized before Pontius Pilate. He was baptized by John the Baptist early in his ministry. Well, what does that mean? I believe it means this. When he stood before Pontius Pilate, he agreed with all of the charges the people had brought. He was the Son of God. He did claim to be the Son of God. He didn't cut short. He didn't bail on that. He maintained the good confession all the way to the end. Christ is our example. That was just a couple of days before he was going to die, and it was the confession that confirmed that he did come to die. So what is Paul telling Timothy here? Stay the course. Take hold of it. Yeah, you might be kicked, you might feel like you've taken a step back, but stay the course. People, we're heading somewhere. We're heading somewhere. And then finally, he says, carry out faithfully the ministry God has given to you. Look at verse 20. Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you. Now, I'll be honest, I had to go back and do a study because so many times, 
In the New Testament, the word guard speaks of a military guard, a defense, uh, uh, a protecting guard. That's not what this word is. It's more in the monetary realm. It's guarding a deposit. It is giving attention to and protecting as valuable what God has given to you. What was Timothy's trust? It was the message to the church at Ephesus. He was to guard it against any threat. I wonder today, what has God entrusted to you? Might it be your family to make sure that your family hears the gospel? Might it be our children, our youth? I'm going to probably step on toes, but I'm going to do it because it's on my heart. We're not stepping up with our children, people. We're not stepping up. We're not doing it. We're, we're, we're trying to beg and find people to work with our children. Do you realize that what these children are going to go through, we have no idea? And do you realize that we've got about five years that we can pour Christ into them? We ought not be begging people to work. We ought to have people busting down the doors. Let me work with these children. I have a heart for them. It may just be just to be there what has god entrusted to you what has he are you just sucking air you just living your life i'm just sucking the air that god's given me i'm just taking it all in what about those days when you used to serve god what about them wasn't it wasn't it great? Wasn't it fulfilling to go home and say, you know, God is using me. Paul said, guard the trust. And then he closes about warning him about false teaching again. So this is a manual to the church. So what's he doing? He's saying, be careful. They're out there, the gnosis, the people who have knowledge, who seem to be more spiritual. Be careful. Look at what you, if it were in today's lingo, watch what you watch on TV. Not everybody who portrays God and is, is flashing fancy things is real. But then he closes, grace be with you all. It is by grace that you've been saved if you're a believer. It is by grace that you stand, and it is by grace that you will stand. And so after everything Paul said to the church of instruction, his thought was grace be with you all because grace was what is what would enable them to do what they needed to do. Let's pray. Our Father... We come to you in the name of grace to us, Jesus Christ. And Lord, I praise you that you loved us enough to send Jesus to die for us. We thank you that he has been raised from the dead and lives forevermore. Lord, this beautiful doxology about Jesus that we read in our text today. Help us, Lord, to keep our eyes on you, fixed on you, not pulled away by the dangers of materialism, although you've given us things to enjoy, but Lord, to recognize you as the giver of all good things, and Lord, to protect ourselves from the things that would threaten us, that we might be a testimony for you, and I pray this in Jesus' name.